Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone here, both in person uh, and whether you're watching online, to the York County History Center. Uh, before we get started, I just have just a few announcements to read. Uh, first off is that the Tannenberg Summer Orchid Concert Series has begun again. Uh, those will run every Friday through July and August, starting at 1215, uh, just out in our lobby here. Uh, we will have organists performing throughout the region uh, on our 1804 Tannenberg organs, free concerts that are open to the public. Uh, guided tours of the Bonham House, which is just a few doors down, are now being offered on Saturdays through July. Uh, these are guided tours that begin at 11 o'clock and 2 o'clock. 
Uh, you can schedule your tour either online or on the phone, or if you come into the museum and talk to our receptionist. Uh, the next York County Civil War Roundtable will be on July 21st at 7 p.m., which will be in this room here at the main museum. Ron Kirkwood will be delivering a presentation titled George Spangler, the Most Important Farm in the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, Living History Saturday will be on July 24th from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. at the Colonial Complex. Uh, vis visitors will be able to watch demonstrations on flax processing, leatherworking, and 18th century cooking. Hands-on activities include quill pen writing and sewing. Visitors can also visit with our Revolutionary War soldier who will be at the event. Our next early American cooking demonstration, which I believe will be streamed to our Facebook page, will be on July 27th from 11 to 1. Uh, Christine Cooper will be making slapjacks and Johnny cakes. Uh, and don't forget to join us uh, in August's uh, first Friday, which is an event all throughout the city, uh, at the Gates and Plow Tavern uh, for some 18th century games and light refreshments. Uh, and just so you're all aware, our next second Saturday will be on August 14th. And our speaker for today is David Donaldson. Uh, David was born and raised in Virginia. Shortly after graduation from college, he moved to the West Coast. After a dozen years and nearly as many jobs, including working for the University of California, in 1998, David decided to make a hike to the granddaddy of all hiking trails, the Appalachian Trail. Choosing as his trail named Spirit of 48, in honor of the 50th anniversary of Earl Schaefer's first hike along the Appalachian Trail, he was awestruck when first meeting the legendary hiker who had embarked upon his third and final through hike nearly the same, earlier the same year. As fate would have it, David and Earl hiked the, same, hiked the state of Maine together, culminating in their climbing to the summit of Mount uh, Katahdin, the trails in the... Katahdin, thank you. Uh, the trails northern terminus. Shortly thereafter, Earl agreed to let David write his biography. In 2004, David and his family moved to the Shiloh area of York, buying a property that sits directly beside the home Earl and his family grew up in. David has a doctorate education in education, a doctorate degree in education, and works as a special education teacher for the school district of the city of York. He's married and is the father of two. Ladies and gentlemen, David Thank you. Thank you folks for showing up today. And uh, before I get into my introduction of myself, I feel like I'm having to go to the monitor here. Yeah. Um, I, I am a school teacher, so um, I'm always used to looking around to make sure everybody's paying attention. So if I if you see me giving you the eye, it's just that part of my brain that just can't seem to turn off. Um, but ju just a quick story on my trail name. When, when you hike the Appalachian Trail, most people will choose a trail name. For instance, Earl christened himself Crazy One, since he was the first person to hike the Appalachian Trail. A lot of people thought he was crazy for doing it. So on the trail, his trail name was Crazy One. The trail name that I chose prior to hiking uh, was Spirit of 48 in honor of Earl Schaefer. Uh, when I talked to a previous hiker and asked him about Earl Schaefer, he said, well, I think he's dead. And being somebody who enjoys history a lot, I thought, well, that's too bad. I knew 98 was gonna be the 50th anniversary hike. So prior to getting on the trail, I learned about trail names and I decided rather than somebody labeling me like burps a lot or something like that, because if you don't pick a trail name, other people will pick it for you. I went out choosing the trail name Spirit of 48, thinking Earl is dead. So when I finally met Earl a couple of months later on the trail, I told him, this story. And, and I ended it by saying, you look pretty good for a dead man. And he, he, got, a, he got a good laugh out of that. My name is David Donaldson, and my wife and I and our twins live in West Manchester Township. We live right off of Church Road. I live right behind the seven acre former truck farm where Earl and his family grew up in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. We just got back from a trip to Disney World. My, my kids graduated from high school, West Manchester, uh, the West York Area School District. We got back the other day and then we're flying out to Washington State to go visit relatives there. My son is going into the Air Force in August. So I had no idea months ago when Christine contacted me that this was gonna fall right in between um, those two trips, but I'm really glad that it worked out um, the way that it did. I wanna go ahead and read something to you. This is from the National Geographic Magazine of August, 1949. 
On August 5th, 1948, a certain shoe manufacturer missed the chance of a lifetime. He should have been on a bleak mountaintop to greet a tired but happy hiker in ragged footwear. The weary walker was Earl B. Schaefer of York, Pennsylvania. On that day, he reached the summit of Mount Katahdin in central Maine. Thousands had preceded Schaefer to that rocky pinnacle, but he had just walked more than 2,000 miles over the whole length of the Appalachian Trail. He had left Mount Oglethorpe, Georgia on April 4th. He was the first, so far as the record shows, to traverse that Olympian footpath in a single continuous journey. I asked the redoubtable hiker how many pairs of shoes he wore out in four months of hoofing it over rock and rubble on leaf, mold, and pine needles through swamp and stream grid. One pair of boots lasted the whole way, he replied, but they were in tatters at the end. Oh, and by the way, those boots that were in tatters at the end are in the Smithsonian American History Museum like to see them there down there. Is anybody here not familiar with who Earl was? Everybody kind of knows who he was a little bit? Okay, well, his claim to fame is as the first through hiker of the Appalachian Trail, which was conceived back in the 1920s. It was completed in the 1930s. 2000 miles, people believed it was going to be impossible literally for anybody to hike it in one continuous trip. In fact, while Earl was hiking on the trail in 1948, in the summer of 1948, the Appalachian Trailway News, a publication of the then Appalachian Trail Conference, published an article stating why it would be impossible for anybody to hike the entire trail in one season. So by doing that, Earl really broke uh, a barrier of sorts. And, and, you know, it's sort of like Roger Bannister who broke the four minute mile. Once somebody does it, then other people realize mentally, okay, this is possible. So today, I think close to 10,000 people have hiked the trail. Just about all of those people know who Earl was and Earl is very much considered a legend in the hiking community. And I always find it kind of interesting when I go to a hiker get together, of course, everybody there knows about or a lot of people have met him. He passed away. It's been almost 20 years now, but a lot of people met him and talked to him over the years. And yet when I talk about Earl in New York, a lot of people are like, who? Earl who? So we're hoping maybe one day to, to maybe, maybe hope to garner him a little bit more recognition. If it happens, great. If not, um, he still has the Smithsonian. In 2006, Earl's brother, John, made a DVD biography of Earl. And that's what I want to show you right now. It's about 30 minutes. It's very comprehensive. It actually delves into a lot of local history as well as family history as well. So I thought I would go ahead and I'll show you that. When that is finished, uh, among the many other things that Earl did, he was a poet. And he's authored over, well, 1,300 poems as, as, as we know. I'm not going to read them all to you, but I brought a couple along that I thought you might enjoy listening to. So um, if you don't mind, I'll go ahead and we'll start the bio DVD. And then when that is over, I'll read you some poetry and I'll be happy to take any questions. The short pictorial biography of Earl Victor Schaefer, born November the 8th, 1918, died May the 5th, 2002. He graduated from William Penn Senior High School in York, Pennsylvania in a college preparatory course. During his lifetime, he was a carpenter, antique dealer, auction clerk, poet, hiker, environmentalist, author, and musician. In his early teens, he hired out with local farmers, was also a fur trapper. He is credited as starting through hiking on long distance hiking trails. Earl's mother was Frances Gallagher Schaefer. She married Daniel Schaefer II in Reading, Pennsylvania, July the 3rd, 1913. Her father was Irish and her mother Scotch. Her father had just moved to Reading and Daniel either had to travel to Reading to continue courting or marry her. 
She was instrumental in Earl's education and inspired him to become a poet. She died December the 27th, 1933, when Earl was 15 years old of complications of gallbladder surgery. Daniel the Schaefer II was the son of Daniel Schaefer I, who was a school teacher and tobacco farmer in North Cadoras Township, York County, Pennsylvania. His father died when Daniel was 16 years old. He worked as a farmhand, brick maker, cabinet maker, silk weaver, and chain welder. He married Frances A. Gallagher, July the 3rd, 1913. He died on August the 15th, 1949, of what was termed coronary occlusion. He was a good father and did not remarry after his wife's death. In the spring of 1923, Daniel and Francis moved to a seven acre farm in the village of Shiloh to find a safer environment for the children. Francis contended that the streets of York were dangerous for children due to the horses and wagons bolting about in the streets. The truck farm raised chickens, her eggs grew fruit and vegetables, which Francis, assisted by the children, sold from horse and wagon, which were part of the farm purchase. The house was a story and a half oak log structure built in the late 1700s. The exact date was never established. The land was traced back to John Penn. The barn was a big barn built much later. It was supplied with water from a perpetual spring. Electrical service was eventually added the day after Earl left for Army service in 1941. Indoor plumbing was added in 1949. It stayed in the family for over 50 years. It has been remodeled and added to since purchased by John Stover and his wife. This picture shows the family before Evan and John were born. It was taken in York, PA, before the family moved to Shiloh. Daniel III on the left, Earl in the middle, and Sister Anna on the right. They lived at 1020 West Popper Street in York, Pennsylvania at the time. This picture was taken at the family farm near the village of Shiloh shortly after moving in. Dan II on the right with Francis on the left rear. Earl from front left, Anna, Daniel III on the right, and Evan in the front on the end. Teddy, their first dog that came to the farm, is in the foreground. The spring for water was located just to the left and rear of this maple tree. This is a school picture of Earl, age six. He attended Shiloh School, a two-room brick structure located on Church Road, about seven-tenths of a mile east of the Schaefer Farm at the time. No busing was available, so the children walked each day to and from school in all kinds of weather. In 1927, a four-room school was built on School Street, which was about one-tenth mile closer home. This picture was taken a summer prior to her mother's death. It was the last picture taken of her. It shows all the family except our father and Daniel number three, who was serving in the US Army in Hawaii at the time. It shows Anna holding a watermelon grown on the farm. Rear left, John, Francis, front left, Earl, Anna, and Evan. This picture is of Earl and sister Anna with our dog puppy. It was taken in front of one of the many fruit trees on the farm. Puppy was a fearless pit bull that tackled wild animals when given a chance. A few years after this photo was taken, he killed a chicken house full of chickens at a neighbor's farm. This ended his career. This was Earl's graduation picture from William Penn High School in 1935. Earl skipped a grade and graduated at age 17. He took an academic course that would prepare him for college. Money was tight and college was not in sight. Instead, Earl worked for the local farmers and trapped furs during the winter. Eventually, he went to work as a carpenter for a home builder contractor, W.E. Henry. During these teen years, he and neighbor Walter Weinmiller would take Sunday walks. 
Earl met Walter shortly after the family moved to Shiloh. This picture was taken by Earl. From the left to right, Elmer Weinmuller, John Schaefer, William Weinmuller Jr., Walter Weinmuller, and Kenneth Weinmuller. This was taken at Cadora's Furnace near the Susquehanna River, a considerable distance from home, but a typical height for the group. Cadora's Furnace produced ammunition for the American Army during the Revolution. This is the adjoining May Farm, where Walter, Daniel III, Earl, Evan, and John worked as farmhands in their teens. The farm is now subdivided into new homes. This picture was taken about 1950. It was formed by Howard Amy, later by Frank Myers, while John was working for him. Walter stayed with Howard Amick at his new farm, known as the Poorhouse Farm, near West York, as a hired hand. This canoe was built by Earl from waterproof plywood. It was cut from a four by eight sheet. The bottom from the center and the sides were made from the remaining panel side pieces. Strips of oak formed the support at the bottom and top. Wooden wedges formed the end pieces. It was used by Earl to assist in muskrat trapping. Later, John used it for the same purpose. William Weinmiller Jr. is shown in the Little Conewalker Creek that ran through the May Farm. This spot also served as the local swimming hole. This is a picture of Earl from early 1940. The boys spent most of the summer shirtless and barefoot, except when doing farm work. Earl was five foot 10 inches, and I don't believe he ever exceeded 165 pounds, always staying in good physical condition. He lost very little weight during his three through hikes in 1948, 1965, and 1998. This picture shows a happy night hunting group. They are displaying the raccoon caught this night. This was a favorite sport for the Weinmiller and Schaefer boys. At the time, raccoon pelts brought a good price. They were not as plentiful as they are today. Left to right are William Jr., Walter Weinmiller, Earl and Evan Schaefer. This is a shot of Earl holding a skunk by the tail. This was the result of night hunting for skunks. Many times prior to the official start of the season, frequently the participants were sprayed by a musk of the skunk. If you were unlucky enough to get a hit in the eyes, it was an experience you would never forget. They were captured at night, penned up, and fed until the start of the season, then killed for the pelt. This is a picture of Earl's first tent, also one of the first camps Earl and the Weinmiller brothers made. The two-man crawl-in tent that Earl bought with his farm and trapping money was a real jewel for them. The homemade shelter in the rear was good enough up until that time. It was made of feed bags sewed together and waterproofed with wax. Walter and William Weinmiller Jr. are shown. Earl took the picture. The next picture was taken in North Carolina of a group of Earl's friends while on maneuvers prior to shipping overseas. Earl volunteered for one year of service while he was awaiting call by the draft board prior to the Second World War. Of course, before the one year of training was complete, we were attacked at Pearl Harbor and all enlistments were for the duration. Notice the World War I style helmets. Meanwhile, William Jr. and Walter Weinmiller enlisted in the Marines as a brothers team. They took, took their training at Paris Island, South Carolina, still a basic training place in the East. This picture shows a muskrat catch Walter made during a furlough prior to the deployment overseas in the Pacific Theater. This picture shows Earl dressed and ready for guard duty. Notice the change of helmet style to the more protective type of World War II. They still used leggings, however. This was probably in early 1942, before shipping out to Hawaii. This picture is of William Weinmiller Jr., known as Gord, named after his favorite comic strip character, Flash Gordon. 
the wine millers through the years had a Sunday motor paper route with their father driving. William was on furlough after participating in a successful tour in the Pacific. The next tour took him to Iwo Jima where he was wounded while searching for souvenirs. This is the last picture of Walter Weinmiller taken at the Schaefer home while he was on furlough prior to the Iwo Jima campaign where he was killed on the beach while landing. A mortar shell made a direct hit. Later, Earl said he had a premonition about Walter's death on the day that it occurred. This is a picture of Earl with his newly issued sidearm after arriving in Hawaii. It was standard issue for his type of duty in the Signal Corps in 1942. This is a picture of Earl practicing archery. Even in the service, he handmade his own bow and arrows. He wrote a poem suggesting the army make use of archery as a weapon. He claimed it would be a silent and effective weapon for snipers. His bows were either fashioned from lemon wood or Osage orange wood. This is a picture of Earl and his first time on climbing spurs. He was not formally trained in signal corps school with their use, but picked it up very quickly on the job. He used them often in his radio and radar installation in South Pacific outposts where they worked. They were also handy for acquiring coconuts. Earl loved fresh coconut milk. This is a beach shot of Earl. Not all the time was spent working during a wait for material to arrive. They even took a tour of an island using an army truck. They also did some hiking and climbing to pass the time. When the material arrived, they would work long hours until the job was completed. Earl's on the left with one of the construction crews he worked with in the Pacific. The crew chief was Mr. Sturdy a civilian working with the Army to construct radar and communications facilities throughout the Pacific Theater of Operations. He is standing next to Earl. While on these assignments, Earl had travel orders that provided him with priority travel to use any and all transportation necessary to complete the job. This is Earl posing on New Caledonia at his foxhole. This was during a construction project there. Even though it was not occupied by Japan at the time, bombings, bombings were conducted at times by the Japanese and foxholes were a safeguard considered necessary. After Earl's discharge from the army, automobiles were in short supply. Earl purchased a 1934 Harley that had been used for police work in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. It served him well for several years. He even joined the York Motorcycle Club, which he rode with frequently. After having an accident, which fortunately was not serious, he decided to acquire an automobile for safer transportation. After his tour of duty in the Army, Earl did some contract carpenter work, including building a new barn at home. This picture shows him taking a break during that construction. This modern barn building, which actually was not used as a barn, but a garage and workshop on the first floor. He finished off about half of the second floor as an apartment living space for himself, which he used for several years. This was Earl's first deer he shot using a Springfield rifle equipped with a scope. This was shot during a hunting trip to Cinema Honing in Cameron County, Pennsylvania. Earl did his hunting for the most part alone. He would stalk his deer rather than staying at a stand. He generally walked to a remote location and rarely encountered other hunters. It was early 1948 when Earl read in an outdoor magazine that no one had hiked the Appalachian Trail in one continuous trip, nor was anyone expected to do this. I can remember that evening as Earl paused and said, I think I would like to try that. He had saved up enough money to outfit himself and with no regular job, he was free to travel. He scoured army surplus stores, including one in Philadelphia and came up with his equipment. The rest is history covered in walking with spring. 
Earl took very few pictures of himself during his trips. When he was asked how he was able to take his own picture, he explained that he would tie three sticks together, make use of the timer on his camera. This picture was taken at Center Point Knob. This was Earl's second visit to Center Point Knob. In 1937, he and his brother Evan hiked from Snowy Mountain Fire Tower near Caledonia to a point north of Dillsburg. Reaching the summit of Katahdin in four months and four hours on his 1948 hike, it became his favorite mountain. He climbed Katahdin a total of seven times, twice staying overnight, once in a raging storm. It wasn't a very smart place to be with all the lightning and wind. He has several sunset pictures in his collection from the summit of Katahdin. Staying at the summit overnight is no longer permitted. This is a picture of his 1948 bird sugar boots used for the entire trip, repaired many times. Sometimes the seams were sewn by Earl, other times resold and repaired by a shoemaker. They are currently being preserved by the American History Museum at Smithsonian in Washington, DC, along with some other artifacts from his three trips. His colored slides, poetry, and all his manuscripts are also being preserved by them. When money becomes available, they plan a display. This picture is of Dan Hope, local congressman, Earl, and Murray Stevens of the Appalachian Trail Conference. The occasion was a relocation of the trail north of the original route that took it across the Second Street Bridge at Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. The primary location was due to the Indian Tau Gap military reservation restrictions. The relocation was almost totally done by Earl with a bridge crossing of the Susquehanna River at Amity Hall, just north of Don Cannon, where this picture was taken. This picture shows Earl on the left top of rock, singing and playing his ukulele during a break and a hike. Earl often did this for a group of hikers, sometimes singing his original compositions. I'm not sure of the location, perhaps some of you can identify the spot. I believe the group to be the York Hiking Club. This picture was of Earl Shamrock. He was proud of his part Irish heritage. This plant was a gift from his sister Anna. It survived many years under adverse conditions in Earl's room. Basically, Earl used a wood stove for heat. The shamrock hung in a window that didn't receive a lot of sunlight. During his 1998 trip, a neighbor watered it on occasion, but it nearly died. I tried to maintain it at my home after Earl passed on, but it died several weeks after Earl passed on. This picture was taken a night before Earl started his 1998 trip. He had attended his brother's second marriage this day at Greenville, South Carolina. He is shown weighing in at a family home before starting off on the next day on his third through hiking attempt. This is his send off at Springer Mountain by his nieces and nephews that lived in Greenville, South Carolina, who delivered him to Springer Mountain. Among them are Ray Schaefer, Bob Schaefer, Debbie Payne, her husband Sam Payne, and their children. From the left, Anna, Jennifer, and Sam Jr. This is the actual start of the hike with his nephew Bob leading the way. Bob took time off from his civil service job in Seattle, Washington to start the trip and evaluate Earl's hiking. After a few days with Earl, he left Earl proclaiming that Earl was fit for the trip. Bob accompanied his uncle Earl on many hikes and camping trips as a youngster, grew to love the outdoors, he was a volunteer rescue team member with the National Park Service in Seattle, Washington area. This trip was largely uneventful until Bob Peoples Hostel stopped in Virginia. Bob Peoples invited an AP news reporter who broke the story of Earl's attempt to do his 50th anniversary hike. Earl was trying to keep his attempt private since he really didn't know if he could do it at age 79. He had the family neither affirm or deny his attempt when questioned up until that time. 
The next day, Associated Press picked up a story and it was national news. Earl met Dave Donaldson, who was hiking the trail, calling himself the Spirit of 98. He had read Earl's book, Walking with Spring, while teaching in San Diego. He decided to attempt a through hike in 1998, the anniversary of Earl's first hike. Neither knew that the other was hiking in 98 until this meeting in Virginia. This next picture was taken by Dave. He said he just had to have a picture of those famous feet. He and Earl did not hike together at this time, but met a few more times before teaming up at Andover, Maine for the final part of the trip to Katahdin. David read Earl's book, Walking the Spring, while in San Diego, California, decided to try it himself. This is a picture of nephew David Schaefer, Earl, and David's daughter, Maggie. They met Earl between Tinker Cliffs and Daleville, Virginia. They were awaiting Earl at a highway crossing when a hiker informed them of Earl's dilemma. He was south of them on the top of the mountain without water, dazed, dehydrated. David purchased water at a nearby convenience store and hiked south to meet Earl. Later, Earl contributed this uh, act by David as saving his life. This picture was taken when I met Earl for the first time in 1998 at Apple Orchard Mountain in Virginia. I had made two prior trips trying to locate him. My son David had finally contacted him a few days earlier. I had to make a quick trip home to take care of some personal business and returned a few days later to make this contact. I had missed him in the morning on a road crossing, but caught up with him by hiking south from the parkway. A party was held at ATC headquarters in Harpers Ferry. This cake was a centerpiece for the celebration. Many of his friends and media were present. Laurie Pottinger of the AT staff was responsible for setting up the event. A York County news photographer, Bill Bowden of the York Daily Record and Laurie accompanied Earl on the next day's hike. Bill returned Earl to York that evening so Earl could attend a Gallagher family reunion the next day. The next day after the reunion, John returned Earl to the site he left without losing more than a half day hiking. This photo was taken by Bruce Dunleavy Ishmael when Earl was approaching Hiking Springs for a scheduled news conference. This was planned in advance due to a lot of pressure from the media for a chance to interview Earl. WGL TV News of Lancaster, Gettysburg Times, Carlisle Sentinel, as well as the People Magazine and others had requested an audience. Earl was always reluctant, but agreed to this plan. This photo shows the Boiling Springs office and the welcome they had for Earl. Many of his friends, as well as the media, were able to spend a few hours with him. As a special treat, we had a watermelon for Earl to take part in consuming. This is part of the media group assembled at Boiling Springs, asking Earl questions regarding his anniversary hike. Among them were television, news media, including national coverage. WGAL-TV of Lancaster, PA, accompanied Earl for the next several miles of his hike. This coverage may be seen on Earl's DVD, Walking with Spring, available through our website. This next photo shows Earl relaxing and signing a copy of Walking with Spring for an admirer at the Port Clinton Post Office. John met Earl to deliver a warmer sleeping bag since the nights were getting cooler. Also, some provisions were delivered to replenish his food supply. Previous meeting had been at Route 501 for resupply of food. This was the last meeting in, with Earl until Jughead Mountain, where Earl was scheduled to meet an important ATC supporter, Mrs. Kellogg. I returned and met Earl with, at Little Bigelow Mountain, where we joined the CBS News crew that was going to tape Earl for a CBS Evening News spot. This picture shows Earl with Harry Smith of CBS at a logging road just prior to crossing the Kennebec River. By this time, Earl and David had teamed up hiking together after staying at the cabin in Andover, Maine. Earl and Margie Towns arranged to have them hike together 
to help each other to complete the trip. This photo shows Earl in the middle of the canoe with Harry Smith paddling in front and Steve Longley, owner of the Portage Service, in the rear, landing on the east side of the river. This was part of the taping sequence for the program. Earl and Margie Towns were instrumental in coordinating this coverage. CBS later that evening hosted a private dinner for the party at a local restaurant where a guitar appeared and Earl sang some of his songs, of which one later showed up on a TV coverage. This picture was taken just before starting the ascent of Katahdin, taken at the Katahdin Falls parking lot before the sun was very high. I hiked up partway, but did not trust my trick knee, which I had re-injured on Little Bigelow earlier and decided to defer the climb. I wish I had completed the climb since it was my last chance to make the climb. My health would not permit it now. This next picture was taken the night before Earl and a group except for me climbed to Todd. They are left to right. Dave, Don and Gail, Johnson, Earl, Huey, John, Abbott, and nephew Bob. Don and Gail were friends from the Greenville, South Carolina area that traveled north just to summit with Earl. Gail is also a through hiker. Nephew Bob also flew in from Seattle to accompany Earl to the top. Huey and Abbott were the crew that filmed Earl's SM. This was at the Baxter State family cabin provided by Buzz. This picture is from the bridge at Katahdin Falls. This is a picture of the group climbing together that day. This is as far as I got on the initial climb. Later this day, I went about a quarter mile further up before learning Earl was descending the other side of Katahdin. I went back down to meet them at Chimney Pond Camp Route for shuttle back to the Baxter Cabin. Left to right are Earl, Dan and Gail Johnson, right front, Jim Coleman, Huey, Bob Schaefer, Abbott of Huey Films, and Dave Donaldson in the rear. This is a picture taken at the sum, summit of Mount Katahdin for the last time in not, October 1998. It was the last climb of Katahdin for Earl. The weather was perfect for the climb of his favorite mountain, providing excellent views from the summit. This picture is the Earl giving the Katahdin poem to Buzz Caverly at the Baxter State Park office the next day after the climb. Buzz was thrilled and immediately made a large copy and framed it for his office wall. He said that the message in the poem was an excellent presentation of Governor Baxter's feelings about the mountain. It appears in the latest book on the history of Baxter State Park. This is a copy of Earl's original notebook page copy. He woke up at 4.30 a.m. in his bunk at the Baxter cabin and printed it in order to capture the thought. He worked by flashlight. I woke up and went back to sleep. I did not know what he was writing until the next morning. I told Earl that we owed Buzz something for all the help he provided us. This was Earl's way of repaying Buzz who would accept no money. This fungus plaque was placed on a room at the AT Lodge in Dillonock, Maine, that Earl and I slept in during our stay after the hike. Don, the owner, was very helpful during our stay. He will not divulge which of the two beds Earl slept in to his guests. I may be the only one who knows for sure. I'm not talking. This was an awards presentation in on Earl's honor of the 50th anniversary of Troop 94 Boy Scouts. He helped start a hiking program and introduced hiking to the troop. Shown left is Assistant Scoutmaster Rodney Miller, Earl, and Scoutmaster with some of Troop 94 Scouts. Miller was one of the troop leaders that was with the Scouts when the program started. Not shown but present was Dick River, Scoutmaster for over 50 years, responsible for helping start the hiking program. This is a picture of one of the Several couples, Earl is credited with becoming husband and wife. Chris and Sam Bagby met at the Rook in the Iron Master's Mansion at Pine Grove, Pennsylvania. 
Chris had through hiked the Appalachian Trail many times, while Sayan is a 2,000 miler and through hiker of several other trails along with Chris. Spur and Ready are their trail names. Next picture is of Earl looking at a t shirt awarded him at Trail Days in Damascus, where he was guest of honor in 1999. He attended even though he was beginning to feel the effects of his illness, which later caused a lot of health problems. His brother Evan and Dave Donaldson attended with him to make sure he was comfortable and did not become too tired. This next award was from the York County Sports Night conducted each year in honor of sports people from the York County that have contributed to sports. Earl was selected to that honor and was second only to Bob Huffman in all time honors. Bob was a weightlifter owning York Barbell as well as other business interests. He was a coach for the US Olympic team for many years, was known worldwide. This was quite an honor for Earl. This picture was taken at the Schaefer family reunion at Sunset Lane Township Park, York, Pennsylvania in 1999. It was the last time all the brothers and sisters were together. Starting from left to right are Daniel III, Anna, Earl, Evan, and John. This is also in order of age. The remaining two brothers are Evan and John. Earl was the first to pass on with Daniel next, followed by Anna. This is a picture of the plaque installed and dedicated to Earl at Hot Springs, North Carolina. It is on the main street in Hot Springs. Dan Wingfoot Bruce was instrumental in having it cast and installed. Earl's boot prints were made, but as yet have not been installed due to a lack of funds, I'm told. This picture was taken in a hospice room that Earl occupied during most of his stay at the Lebanon, Pennsylvania VA hospital. The occasion was the acceptance of his high school's award induction into the Hall of Fame which is given to people with outstanding achievements graduated from William Penn High School in York, Pennsylvania. The jacket he is wearing was one of the items as well as a plaque that was awarded. A student committee each year nominates and then elects a nominee. Earl is thrilled to get this award, always crediting the school for his excellent education. This is the final resting place for Earl. It is a family plot in Shiloh Union Cemetery on the corner of Route 74 and Church Road. His parents are buried there as well as his sister Anna. At present, in addition to the family stone, which carries an etched picture of our home. This veteran's plaque is the only evidence of Earl's final resting place. At some future date, it would be nice to have a plaque with either a poem or other indication of his accomplishments added. This poem, Lone Brave's Farewell, was written by Earl. It is the first and last stanza only. Earl was given a nickname of Lone Brave by Walter Weinmiller. He wrote 12 personal poems about himself as Lone Brave. From the board of Phil. last few bars of music that you heard that was actually Earl singing in addition to his poetry he also wrote songs and performed them and I like to think of his genre as being kind of rickety vintage I'm not sure if there's that genre Earl may have invented it I'm not sure I want to honor your time it's 11 15 right now and I know we were scheduled to go to 11 15 um would it be, I'll, I'll just read one of his poems. Would it be okay if I just, and then we can conclude if anybody has uh, any questions. So as I had mentioned before, Earl has written over 1300 poems that we know about 400 specifically during his time in World War II. And I honestly believe at some future date, he may very well be as well known, maybe more well known for his compilation of poetry. I'm not aware of any other soldier that produced that much poetry and a lot of his poetry is just slice of life things and i think about for instance 
Gettysburg. The big general histories have been written. They were written for the first 50 years after the war. Now, for the real buffs, they're delving into individual diaries. Um, so I have no doubt at some point, Earl's wartime poems will be of interest to future generations. But I want to read one here to you. It sort of sums up Earl's philosophy of life. Um, and it's also the title of one of the books over there. Um, and if you'd like to stay afterwards, I do have some books. We have a foundation. I don't have anything for sale, but if you'd like to take a look at anything over there, um, I'd be more than happy. Calling Me Back to the Hills by Earl Victor Schaefer. The whippoorwills call and the laughing owl song are calling me back to the hills, to the best place of all, where I know I belong, where the water falls, tumbles, and spills. In my innermost dreams is the sigh of the pines as the soft siren song of the trails with the murmuring streams where the laurel entwines far out in the wilderness veils. In the banner unfurled at the closing of day, the returning of the break of dawn, and the wood smoke that curls up to the sky and away is the tension that's luring me on. Through the mist of the morning that creepingly swirls like wraiths through each little ravine, or meadows unshorn where the dewdrops are pearls, I'll gaze on a half hidden scene. I'll awake to the song of the thrush in the tree, exultant at daylight's return. The bond will be strong when he's singing for me that paean for which I ever yearn. Then I'll seek out that most perfect valley of all that I've pictured so long in my mind and submit to the mystic yet relevant call whose lure is to seek and to find. I never shall mind if the terrain is strange. My compass is trusty and true. I'll just travel blind and scout out the range and trust to my luck to come through. I'll sit by my campfire each nomadic night, the muse of the present and past, and I'll follow the spire of that soul-stirring light till I reach that one valley at last. Thank you very much for coming. Yes, sir. I've seen a presentation that he presented. Ooh, I actually was feeling, uh... That was a slideshow, um, and those are in the Smithsonian, and they've been cleaned up and restore. Um, there's also digital versions of that. But yeah, he had hundreds and hundreds of slides, and he would bury them depending on the group that he was speaking to. But yeah, all of his slides um, down there. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you. He did. He did. Yes. Um, he did. Oh, okay. He sold sort of antiques. He did. Stuff. He had a, he, he, you know, what one of the very interesting things about Earl, that he's credited not only as being the first Appalachian Trail hiker, but also the first lightweight hiker. He, he really believed that you needed to travel light in order to travel comfortably and far. And, and he believed you needed to choose exactly what you needed. So when he went out, he just was a real minimalist. Prior to that, people would go out with big, huge packs and, and they'd have their bedrolls on back and, and 50 pounds of gear. He carried no more than 20, 25 pounds in 1948, which was almost unheard of, probably considered unsafe at the time. And yet, when you went to his home, when you saw his barns, stuff everywhere. Um, yeah, one of the things he did after he got back from the World uh, War is he met a gentleman who was into antique, and he would go to uh, sales. He, he might want one thing, but he'd have to buy the whole lot, and everything else would go into the bar. bar. He'd also refinish pieces of furniture for people like that. But uh, yeah, he, he did live off of Pinchot Road between approximately 1965 and 1980 around in those years and then um in the actually i guess a little bit later than that till 85 then he moved over to a place in adams county but yes it is. yeah i don't know if you're familiar with bob k Frank photography which is um boy my mind's slipping down the road that the right turn you make to go down towards pinch park um but that that was where he lived on that farm. 
if you have any other questions, I'll be happy to step over here and ask them for you. Thank you very much again. Thank you.